Before I dive into some finer details, I wanted to give a big picture. What we're looking at here is a major development of at least three and a half thousand acres. It involves 2924 Kyogle Road, 2956 Kyogle Road, 2984 Kyogle Road, 322 Kyogle Road, and the one that you can't find anywhere mention of, 3234 Kyogle Road. Now, this comes from the Planet uh, Consulting PDF that was sent through to me as a prospective buyer showing what was going on with the village or the the intended it does not include the commercial district at uh, 33220 Kyogre Road but what I wanted to do here was just have a look at the big picture uh, these are the different owners, Kemp Cove, Peter Van Lysout, Dolf Cook, Darko Kovac, Zimmerland and Wollumban Horizons, which at the time this Planet Consen, uh, Consulting document was put together, Wollumban Horizons was in liquidation and would not be the owner of the property. So the fact that they can falsely represent that there, um, a year after it's been put into liquidation, falsely representing them as owning an asset that will be part of the development and a key part. Now we have been focusing on 3222 and that's why I want to look today more at the other addresses and the bigger picture and the people involved. Because um, like uh, Peter Van Lyshout, Lyshout says on LinkedIn that he is the director of Kemp Cove. Now on the searches that I've done I've been able to find out uh, it comes up with his cross directorships. Kemp Cove is not listed as one of his cross directorships. So it it may not mean that it's um, not one of his companies because he might have that listed as Peter Van Lyshout instead of Peter Anthony Van Lyshout and so it doesn't come up under the same connection so it doesn't necessarily mean it but it's also something that needs to be investigated and Zimmerland is 100% uh, Peter Van Lyshout I've searched him and know this for a fact 100% uh, director, secretary and uh, shareholder. So let's look at the properties involved because uh, Dolph Cook as we know is um, biochar master, he likes to call himself char master. Darko Kovac is an unknown quantity. The only thing I can find is a Serbian connection. I don't know anything about him, why he's even listed there, he may may as well be nobody. But anyway, so love Google Earth, it gives a really good look at the picture. Now if you look down here at the bottom where my little hand is, that's 3222, that's where I've been focusing on and down here at the business district. But this whole development encompasses all up round here it's just yeah huge stuff three and a half thousand minimum and if you look here this little thing here biochar industries like you look at around at the land you look at how green and loved it is and then you look at certain places and I did notice it before these places along through here why do they look so so much worse than what's there and that's part of the development proposal. I don't know, is that what Dolph Cook's doing to the land with his biochar? I don't know, you'd be able to tell me if you're a local, but... So you can zoom right in and have a look. This is um, on their Nightcap on Minjimbul documentary. They come to this uh, little sound place 
and they look out on the water. They're talking to that guy um, that poses as a potential buyer, but he's not. He's still in Victoria and probably hopeful. And just an interesting thing, look at the uh, pattern in the trees here. That is clearly regrowth. It is not natural. You can look how natural bush grows compared to the very lined and distinctive regrowth. But even over here, what they're do doing here, this is what uh, done in August this year. Uh, it's been dry over winter, I suppose, but um, you still look at all the water that's nearby. Things can't help but want to grow in this rich soil. Why is it so bad up here? What are they doing? What are all these things here? And over here, you also see that little hut that is right by the dam. There's that little hut. They walk up here, along here to this hut. And somewhere over here is the lookout. Hang on, let me just find it. Right, now I'll take you there. As we are there, there's that um, sound stadium or whatever, um, the stage. There's that little hut by the dam. There's another building tucked up here. Don't know what that is. If you look back on past images, you can see that there were more in other places. That was what the council got them to remove. Now, over here, see this little white speck over here? Pretty sure this is it. That's that little part where they come out and look out over the views to um, the uh, Sphinx Rock and all of that area. Lovely view there. So when we are talking about this development, we're not just talking about this little place here and well I can't say just the business district because it is a vital link for the locals I know that but we're also talking about all this land around here it's a massive development that they're looking at so there's that's the look out there there's that little hut by the dam or whatever there's that stage drive back through here whichever way you come you can also go down there that's where more stuff was and there are by the looks of it other things scattered throughout here like you can see that over the back here there's a couple too I mean this is satellite imagery they might be able to fool the council and if you go onto the council and look at their image these things aren't showing up so much but that is clearly something that is it's got shade that shows depth and it's in the shade of trees so it's um there's one two three four five there's at least five structures already on there and i don't know there seems there was something, there are some things that they're tucking under trees. Now these things, what's that one? That just, yeah, but anyway, that was the one I looked at. That's just an overview of the whole development. It's not just this bald uphill here where there's well, if you consider the damage to the environment here, this is all downhill slope coming down through into the creek as well. So I don't know what uh, what he really does to do his biochar, but it clearly doesn't look from an aerial view like it's doing too much good for the land. And look at these various, that's a huge water pocket and through here. This is um, something that people that need to take care of these things not uh, consider, well lack of consideration. Seriously this actually looks like it's been turned into a four-wheel drive track. That They just get out there and they drive around or do something. It's, I don't understand how they've done to it what they have. 
with the biochar I could understand a little bit but yeah all right so I'm gonna move on to the next thing now this is a much better view of the Mount Burrell commercial district the image is back in February 2010 so <laughs> you've got to go back in time as you can see this is beautiful sunny it's it's summer and but it's like that a lot even during the cooler months it's sunny things aren't as lush and green things tend to die off a little bit as they do when it's not raining as much but as you can see it's rich in growth it very green and lush you've got water that's running behind there so down here is the caravan park and it actually looks in pretty good nick that is not how i saw it which would have been at least what five years later and there's the uh, mount burrell fruit and veggie store look at all that beautiful fruit a lot of that comes from locally grown and organic you know that it's wonderful and here you've got the general store this guy probably a local he's just called in to get a few things while he's filling up and down here is the Sphinx Rock Cafe and look we've even got people that have pulled up to get some shade in the hot sun and have a bite to eat or a refresh looks like the got the boot open and they might be serving themselves and what they don't have they can uh, get or they might have even just pulled up there and walked into the Sphinx Rock Cafe and got something and walked back out to eat it there but this is as you can see a thriving business back in 2010 So that's what Mount Burrow looks like in real life. But what goes on behind the scenes, what makes it a business uh, and commercial district, and especially if one person is controlling all those interests, what are they doing and how are they doing it? And what impact are they having? Because, uh, well, let's, let's face it, the uh, 2020 vision of Mount Burrell doesn't look like the 2010 vision. So this uh, search, now uh, I uh, got 29 searches going back that I was able to access and that was only helpful in the sense of being able to see where they changed the share distribution and value of it as well because um, when you get an historical search it will give you all the um, the ceased former organization addresses so if they've changed regi registered office principal place of business if uh, there's been former directors or secretaries in this case one of those listed was the receiver manager. I'll get into that in a sec because I need to clear up something about that too. And you also have the current distribution of shareholders and then you have people that used to be shareholders or companies and then you have a list of all the documents lodged blah blah. So that's what it looks like on paper and to find out all this information because for me when I'm looking at a time flow I like to start from you know I imagine that as I move through time to observe an event and it unfolds that I start from the top of the list and I work down where all these searches go back to front so hang on so I take the information and I extract it I pretty much do my own uh, current and historical report. I'm not going to pay three hundred odd dollars to have someone do it for me. And as far as uh, paying for any of the credit viability of a business, I really think it's overrated. 
Now, there's a couple of points I wanted to bring up about Mount Burrell Commercial. And I find it easier, like with all the other companies I've done extracts on, I've done exactly the same thing. It's very easy to look at them. Most of them are, well, all the others are only just one page. This one is three pages because there have been uh, a lot of shareholders and there have been some recent new additions to the information that I previously held. But first I need to clear up the uh, receiver manager status. When I looked at return of receive receiver manager, it wasn't return as in come back, the receiver manager comes back. It was the paper document, I finished up, there's a return that needs to go through. So essentially it's a record of final account. So the reason that I answer a lot of these questions is because I ask them. Uh, I ask the question, where are the annual returns on any of these places? And I have an answer for that now too. But the receiver manager was appointed on from the, that period, the 18th of April to the 14th, uh, 4th of May, 2018. Sorry, so many interruptions. As you can tell, I've got a squeaky door. <laughs> okay. So we were at the receiver manager. He's been appointed 18th of April to the 4th of May 2018. Now the interesting thing here is that on the 14th of August 2018, Adrian Brannock appeared in court and his bankruptcy was finalised and he was made um, confirmed bankrupt. And at that time, he was, just prior to that, he took on sole directorship and secretary of the Mount Burrell Commercial. And during that time, after he's um, put with Lumban Horizons into liquidatorship and stripped it bare of any assets down to a dollar share, <laughs> one, one share and a dollar, um, in comes a receiver manager. Now the thing is that the receiver manager was satisfied because the reason they were appointed was because of a debt and the debt was paid and the receiver manager ended. But the receiver manager left the managership of the Mount Burrell commercial in the hands of a guy that had already been served a bankruptcy notice and by the official dating of when they take it from when you are a bankrupt he could technically be classified as one when the receiver came in. Now why didn't any of these people know that these activities were going on? The same as when a judge in court is making a ruling he doesn't take into consideration that the guy standing before him is a bankrupt. He's he's bankrupt and he's representing a multi-million dollar development. You know? And it's just ridiculous. And the year before that, he had the um, thing where with perpetual trustees where him and his wife ended up getting sued by them because he wanted to set up his sovereignty claim over the land and not pay for the loan. Didn't work. And maybe lost investors when they wonder where some of the lost money went to. Maybe it was to some of his other debts. Don't know, that's a question that people should be asking and official people should be asking it. I'm horrified to see some of the judgments that have come out of some people that classify themselves in a position to rule on these things. It's, it's ridiculous. So the interesting fact is that Adrian Brennock on the 14th of August 2018 was finalised as a bankrupt and he will serve a minimum three year period before he can 
apply to be discharged from that. It can be extended up to eight years. But it doesn't matter how long he's in bankruptcy or not, if he's going to jail for crimes that he's doing in hiding the assets that control his major controlling interests still in Mount Burrell Commercial and the whole development as well through NCV Enterprises. And hang on, I'll just have a look at my list here. <laughs> All right, so uh, about six days before his final bankruptcy hearing, Adrian Brannock transferred his sole directorship and secretaryship of another company, and he was sole shareholder in it, of Nyepi. Now, I've mentioned Nyepi before. Nyepi, he then, six days while he was under service of a bankruptcy notice, went and moved his shares into his wife's name and he also changed uh, ceased being director and secretary and put her as director and secretary so that they, as a couple, they still get to receive the ben and he still controls it all through that. She's just like any good wife's doing the secretary job, you know. Anyway, so as Nyepi, there are four different sets of shares in companies that I've been able to identify. And through those four sets of shares, they have likewise connections because they have shares in other companies. So I'm going to start with the shares that are directly named by uh, as Nyepi is a shareholder directly. Now that's 45 shares of NCV Enterprises out of 10,000 and I think it's 91 now actually. Uh, 100 shares in Yadaki Capital which is one third. 10 shares in Nightcap Construction which is half with Dixon Rainmaker, which is 100% um, Philip Dixon. And 100 shares in Rainmaker Group Holdings, one third. Now, as shareholders of those companies, Yadaki Capital owns 1,000 shares of NCV Enterprises which is pretty much all of it, <laughs> okay? Now, as shareholders of Nightcap Construction, they own 980 shares in Nightcap Village Holdings. Then, through Rainmaker Group Holdings, they own 1,200 shares in Mount Burrell Commercial and 510 shares in Nightcap Village. And when I say they, I'm talking about Adrian and Christy Brennock, okay? I'm not talking about um, they as a company, I'm talking about they as individuals. They represent Nyepi, Adrian and Christy Brennock. So ultimately, through all that, they're controlling NCV Enterprises, Yadaki Capital, Nightcap Construction, Rainmaker Group Holdings, NCV Enterprise, Nightcap, oh, I already mentioned that, but major shareholdings. I listed it twice because they've doubled up through different connections. Nightcap Village Holdings, Mount Burrell Commercial, and Nightcap Village. So that's uh, seven different major shareholdings and interests that Adrian Brennock was able to, six days before his final bankruptcy hearing, to move those sh that share into his wife's name of Nyepi that holds all these interests. So it was very easy to manoeuvre control just on paper and have him completely out of it. But on paper here, we've still got Adrian Brennock after the 14th of August, still being sole director and secretary 
of the Mount Burrell commercial as a bankrupt. And this here, this receiver manager, when he came in as a receiver manager, surely he would have checked out the sole director and secretary and found out that he had a bankruptcy notice lodged against him. I mean, surely this is part of his due diligence. A receiver manager is pretty much a bookkeeper that's sent in to study your books and find out what's going on and to put you on track and to investigate the people that are responsible for putting it in that condition. Now, when the receiver manager came in, they're dealing with AB, Adrian Brannock. But that was then. Before Adrian Brannock came in, as seems to be the case, that this one here, Cherie Francis Stokes, starts off a lot of what would start out as being a pre-set up company. Someone says, right, give me this, already set up, they pay so much for it, they change the company name and they start up using it for whatever they want. It's quicker and easy, easier. So what is very common is that uh, Cherie Francis Stokes and quite often the sole director and secretary and shareholder of smaller shares to begin with, 10 shares worth $10 or 20 shares worth $20. Like in this instance, her original shares showed 20 shares worth $20. See, I've got up here share variations. And I did, through all the 29 different uh, extracts, go through to find where they changed the value of the shares, the total dollar value, and also the number of shares. Because the way I would look at it, since there's no coming, not, not much coming back in the way of business from leaseholders, successful business holders in the commercial district, the only way that Mount Burrell Commercial can actually be increasing its value share to be 3.75 million is to actually get people to invest in it. So from the one person that originally held $20, uh, 20 shares for $20, ended up 5,600 shares for $3.75 million. Now I don't think that you could look at in the last, and that was, that is, even though that was listed last year, that is still current this year. They have not changed share distributions and the total value that has been contributed by the shareholders because this must be looked at purely as money invested by shareholders. It cannot be looked at as profit return to the shareholders for their investment. For that we need to actually look at annual returns to see what was distributed to shareholders. But then let's take a look at the very basics of who's running Mount Burrell Commercial District right now. Philip Dixon. Philip Dixon, one of the um, associated landowners has always been associated right from the word go in the background with a lot of the time Cherie Stokes starting up these companies and running them and then getting them to a stage where they pull out and other people take over. Now maybe it's planned that uh, Philip Dixon will head the reins until AB gets discharged from his bankruptcy because um, if all had gone according to plan he wouldn't have to wait too much longer because he's already served, you know, what is it, August 2018 or perhaps a little bit earlier. Three years from there he would be looking at some time next year of coming out of it and he could perhaps take up directorships and shareholdings again. But 
not if you're found out to have concealed assets from the bankruptcy declaration. And the ATO are the ones that you hid it from. That makes it a conspiracy to commit fraud, which you can only actually commit a, com a conspiracy to defraud if it's a Commonwealth entity, which the ATO most definitely is. So Adrian Brennock hid his involvement through Nyepi six days before his final bankruptcy hearing. If it had been declared in the bankruptcy hearing, Nyepi would not exist to have any of those shares. It would have been taken in to the bankruptcy or the owners of Nyepi would now actually be changed because they are now taking money from that interest of Nyepi in all these companies. Instead of Adrian and Christy getting it, the ATO or other creditors would get it. Now I know that um, I saw a post, I was going to bring it up earlier. I know people in the area know Rhyme Earth Healer. And I was going to share his post rather than paraphrase what he said because um, he got pushed out. Because he started asking what's going on and things weren't working very professionally. And a level of professionalism is certainly expected when you are a shareholder of a major business asset. And basically uh, he was pushed out and he can't get his money back. Yet we are told that there is a value share worth 3.75 million. Can they not give him back his 200 shares and flog it off to somebody else? Because you've got other new people that have got shares in. Give back the money to those that don't want to be involved anymore. He paid 200000 Give him his 200000 back. That will still leave you with three and a half million and that will give you 200 shares that I'm sure there is someone out there that hasn't seen these videos and would buy them and replace them. Like these people down here are recent additions, these High Fusion Finance, Cole Malaire, Carmel Schumann, <laughs> Schumann, Calmed, PL and High Fusion. These are all new and the only person that's left has been Matthew Perryman who was actually co-director with the initial set up person Cherie Stokes. So other than that most of these people. Um, I know Ryan Earth Healer doesn't want to, he's lost his life savings as has so many people that have invested in things that these people are involved with. Just give them back their life savings. You know whether it's something that like people, I know Ryan said that he owned his house, didn't own anything for it, he sold it to buy in and now he's paying rent working on someone else's land. This is not only taking people's life savings but you are destroying their ability from what they had built to bring themselves forward. You're lining your own pockets at their expense. Now you have got all that value in Mount Burrell Commercial, Philip Dixon. Now as director and secretary, this man does not want to be part, does not want to be a shareholder. It is a simple fact to fill out a form. I could even send you the form to fill out. You fill out the form and you give him his $200,000 back. Maybe you should consider interest a little bit. <laughs> and uh, that is just one person that I know for sure does not want to be involved, has been pushed out, has not got any say in it whatsoever. Rainmaker Group Holdings. Well, again, behind them is Adrian Brennock, Phil Dixon and 
others. And they are the major movers and shakers controlling everything. Whether, <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether you've got 200 shares. You know, I don't think you're getting much money back. Here's Dixon Rainmaking again, Philip Dixon. Philip Dixon, so he's got another 800 shares to add to the Rainmaker Group shares up here, as well as controlling being sole director and secretary. So he's pretty much controlling everything that's going on. So Philip Dixon, it's down to you now. You have the ability, give Rhyme Earther, Earth Healer back is 200,000. Take the 200 shares and let someone else buy them. It's not like you don't have people that will buy into it. As I said, there are still people out there that haven't seen my videos. These three people here are interesting because can't find out much about them. And even though it looks like they're actually, um, I think that there's a, a foreign connection with them and or at least this is why they're beneficially owned. They've been involved for a long time, for many years, and they would have bought in, oops, wrong way. When this share value down here, you know, you've got a hundred shares worth a hundred bucks or something like that, they would have bought in, uh, bought in for next to nothing at this level probably here. Now, supposedly your share value is worth so much more for the thriving business that it isn't at Mount Burrell. Yes, all those leaseholders that aren't paying money. Tell me, are the members paying Mount money to the Mount Burrell um, commercial as leaseholders? Because just because you become the leaseholder doesn't mean you get to not pay and contribute to these shareholders who are running a business and you are a leaseholder, you need to pay or you need to move on. But then again, we've got Philip Dixon, who is a member of the community, who is not going to move them on because the whole aim has been for members of the Nightcap on Minjimble to control the Mount Burrow commercial, and as they have, through other members that have also easily identifiable as involved, Michaela Lowe, Mark Bloomer, I think, is pretty much along with Rhyme Earth Healer. I can't confirm that, but don't think he wants to be in it either. Moat Investments, Richard Moat. Philip Dixon, Philip Dixon. Uh, Foundation Enterprises, yes, yeah, so I've got to get behind them, a couple of these, and find out who, because they've been involved since the beginning. They're probably members too. This guy's in Germany. I really doubt whether he is a member. He is just an investor. And they did intend that they would have uh, investors from outside of the community. So you can assume that not all of these people on here are members of the community, although you can easily identify those that are. So Rhyme Earth Healer is definitely not a member of the community. He bought his entitlement through the Mount Burrell commercial, but ended up with, well, he got pushed out, just like they did at 3222, he got pushed out. It, is, it doesn't matter which uh, business they're doing, it, they will do it to the people that don't agree with their narrative and ask too many, um, honestly, simple questions that should be able to be answered. And companies have to be transparent. There are laws and rules you have to follow. You can't make them up as you go along. And if you think you've been really clever on covering it on paper, every document you've done has been leading back to all these different deceits that are tying in together with the, all the same people. And you know what that makes? All these same people tied together trying to achieve the same thing with criminal actions? That makes for a criminal organisation. And I would say that not keeping proper records is a criminal action. I would say failing to uphold the interests of all shareholders 
is also a criminal offence. I would also say that a bankrupt representing a multi-million dollar development is also a criminal offence. Concealing those assets and shares so he can keep raking in money and benefits and control over it all. Because other than that, there'd be somebody else having control over it, just like his trustee has control over his finances. He can't even borrow 500 bucks without telling people that he's a bankrupt. Not that he's going to tell anybody. He brushes over that fact. Anyway, I've got way off track here. The whole aim was to actually bring an update in the fact that you've seen it's worth 3.75 million. And it might be if it was still in this condition. Uh, but it's not. The Sphinx Rock Cafe. The leaseholders aren't even paying rent each month. There are no leaseholders paying rent each month at the Mount Burrell Fruit and Veg. Don't even know if the Mount Burrell Caravan Park, if anyone's paying per month as leaseholders there. But what we do know is on the 18th of November that this lease is going to be ended and the guy's going to walk away from that too. So there'll be how many leases that will be, or leaseholders, each month that will be contributing to the shareholders' profits that you can expect to return from? Uh, let's see. Mount Barrel Fruit and Veg Shop, zero. Um, general Store, hmm, I don't know. Has someone bought the lease and is taking it over? Don't know. So that could be zero to maybe something. Sphinx Rock Cafe, well, zero. <laughs> so what, as a shareholder, can you expect that Phil and Philip Dixon has done his honour and duty as the trustee of the business to make all the right decisions? Um, what can you expect for your return if it continues with um, maybe what you might get from the leaseholder of the general store and maybe what you get from the leaseholder from the caravan park, but Who's the leaseholder? Is there a lease? Or is it just members? Because it's... I've heard it's just members down in the caravan park. I've heard it's just members at the fruit and veg. And now it's just members at uh, the Sphinx Rock Cafe. And it's... What's it going to end up? Just members at the general store? <laughs> so, how much... As I said, are each leaseholder going to pay each month for the business operating? There's going to be zero return. Well, as I said, it's questionable how much above zero there's going to be. So is it worth $3.75 million, Or is that just how much they've taken in from people to prop up this business? Now, I dare say that if you looked at the bank account, where all these monies were going, looked at the paperwork, you'd get the same thing. The same thing that lawyers, who aren't accountants, uh, don't keep good records. They've got poor records. Again, that's a crime. You have to keep proper records, especially when it's in trust, other people's money. Oh, it's a no-no if you don't. But that's a, a good excuse, isn't it? I got a lawyer to be an accountant and their records were bad just like mine. So I can't tell you there should be $3.75 million worth of money that investors have paid in, but there's $75 now. And uh, we could show you if we had all the paperwork, you know, but we haven't kept it properly. You know, we have poor record keeping. 
because we use a lawyer as an accountant and the one that we do employ uh, that is basically in those capacities like Philip Dixon and Cherie Stokes, well, they're not there to make sure that the money goes to the right people, are they? I mean, come on. Where is their due diligence in any of this? And yes, I'm saying about Cherie Stokes because she's controlling NCV Enterprises right now. She's setting that up for its fall. <laughs> yes, uh, setting it up with let's build it up, let's rake in the shares, and then, oops, bad bookkeeping. And we know that the judge will kick it out because he says, oh, well, I can't decide anything because it's poor bookkeeping. Poor bookkeeping, you dickhead, is illegal. And consistency is intent to defraud. And they've done it over and over and over. So, Judge Derrington, I think it's about time you pulled your finger out of your ass and woke up. Poor records, poor bookkeeping, the constant going back between, oh, I can't explain this because, you know, I didn't keep good records at somebody else's fault and I went to my lawyer to see what accounting records he kept and, oh, guess what? He's a lawyer. He's not an accountant. And his records are even more shit than mine. But that was the way that we meant it to because my lawyer has got all of these different trust accounts where he shifts all this money around, you know, from one bank account to another. And does all, it's all on paper. He just sits there and moves it around. So it should belong in this one spot, but whoops. Now you see it, now you don't. Disappears and vanishes. And then there's no records and paper. And what you do get produced as records and paperwork are clearly not proper records. Phil Mette doesn't exist. It's an anagram of two people's names. Same with Phil Scott, or was it Craig's, Craig, uh, not Craig Scott, Craig Phil or Phil Craig? Again, an anagram of two names. And payments to what foundations that don't exist? I mean, this is total bullshit. So that's it for my update on Mount Burrell. I've given you enough to think about in my opinion and it's probably long enough. But there it is. I'll catch you next time.